straight from the oh, the microphone level is a bit wrong. All right, straight from the five of the week headquarters. It's episode number fourteen. The playoffs are underway in the SBA. The March Madness tournament is also underway in the NCAA, and we got some interesting topics to discuss this week. But first, we'll go over the cast this week. There's no Robotastic. Once again, there's no Danger Golding. There's to a disappointment for some, for a few, there's still no Beowulf. Yeah, he's still busy with work. Yeah, there will be no Beowulf, but there will be a Cryptic Pancake. Welcome. Uh, hello guys, I'm a Cryptic Pancake, I'm the athletic director for the, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and now, after Oko, I am officially the person with the most features on this show. So, take that danger. <laughs> short, short applause for my main man, a Cryptic Pancake here. Uh, it still says Danger Golding on the screen, I'll maybe contact Gorlab about this in a month or two. Uh, in addition to a cryptic pancake, we also have a debutant on the show from my favorite, well, second favorite, runner-up favorite, however you say it, the Maryland Terrapins. It's the shooting guard, Isaac Allen Richmond, also known as Theory on the forums. Welcome, welcome to the show. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's your boy, Theory. I'm here. Um, ready to discuss. Got a lot of things to get off my chest. Uh, let's get into it. And get into it we shall. Uh, first off, uh, I guess we're gonna talk about you a bit more. Everyone knows I'm uh, someone at somewhere. Uh, currently playing for the Duke Blue Devils and Pancake is playing for who? The no, no, oh wait, I'm for Toronto. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Toronto Thunderbirds, and then, as I mentioned, Isaac Allen Richmond for the Maryland Terrapins. Uh, you've been living a bit of a more quiet life for the past season or two, but now you're supposed to be uncapping, so it's a welcome welcome project to get on the podcast, isn't it not? Yeah, no, it's definitely a, it's definitely a step up. Um, it's definitely a, a reminder and a kick in the pants that I need to... Uh, finish up some things, you know, my biography, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, no, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah, that's good to hear. Uh, the Maryland Therapy is already scary this season. There will be a lot more scary come next season. But our topics, our first topic this week is NCAA first round and thoughts regarding the first round. Uh, I'll go through the matchups uh, Arizona Wildcats beat the Virginia Cavaliers and uh, moved on to the is it Elite 8? Yeah, Elite 8 and as well uh, the Indiana Hoosiers battled out a victory versus the UCLA Bruins and moved on. They'll be facing the Arizona Wildcats then the Louisville Cardinals went up against the Villanova Wildcats and uh, Louisville um, one, yeah, Louisville one. <laughs> and the Louisville Cardinals will move on to the Elite Eight, as will the supremely talented Gonzaga Bulldogs, who beat down the Kansas Jayhawks and will face the Louisville Cardinals. Then, on the other side of the bracket, uh, Florida Gators uh, winning the Atlantic Coast Division, but coming up short versus the Texas Longhorns, who had a Exceptional shooting night, uh, fueled by Carlos Pugemont and Chase Clouds, the two guards. Uh, the Texas Longhorns will meet the Syracuse Orange, who advanced past the West Virginia Mountaineers. And rounding out our Elite Eight will be the Duke Blue Devils and the Georgetown Hoyas. Obviously, you have some thoughts on this issue. Uh, as you are playing for the Maryland Terrapins, what did you make of the game and the matchup? Well, as the game was going along, I noticed that um, 
in terms of the stats, in terms of uh, in the work to not necessarily go home. Um, I just kind of, we just kind of did the best with what we did. Um, perspective of, of a big picture. Um, we don't have that much TPE wise, but we, we were pretty decent. We were pretty good. I believe we had like the, the fourth highest or fourth lowest, uh, points against. So I thought our defense was down. Perhaps we maybe, um, need to switch up on some things next time on the next go around. And, uh, big ups to Sean Stockton. He was out there, um, doing in, doing it big, putting in work against our defense. So there's not much that I can really say. Uh, we got beat a better team one that night. Um, yeah, just about it. Uh, Pancake, then uh, you were obviously presenting, hosting the sim for the Sweet 16. What did you, what, were, you, were there anything you were really surprised about or what did you make? Well, I mean, the sim had plenty of surprises. I mean, I've been here, this is my third season now. This is the first time I've seen a sim where there was more than two upsets in the first round. And that was really very surprising to me as I was seeing all of these high seeded teams with great records just drop like flies. And yeah, I mean, if I may add a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, info. Uh, one of the things I noticed is uh, we had a poor shooting night. Just 37% yeah. overall as a team. That's what I was saying is what I want to say too. Especially at, from three, you guys could not shoot. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, I see three it. Three people took shots. <laughs> you were the only one who went 500, then one of them went two for 10, and the other one for four. I mean, I, I, I what you want. But outside of that, it's just, you know, when you go 5 for 14 from the yeah. floor, you know, you're not necessarily... That's 1 for what? 1 for 6? 1 for 7? Hmm. Well, also, 7 for 22 is just not the best to shoot from 3. And I mean, Georgetown, on the other hand, they took a combined 5 3-pointers as a team. But... They made 2 of 5. Yeah, I mean... Like I said, man... Really John Stockton was out there. He went fifty percent as well, and it's a, it's more efficient. Um, only missed four shots on the night. Yeah, five. Yeah, five. Okay, oh yeah. no, I'm looking at the wrong guy. Or no, this eight for thirteen, Sean Stockton. Yeah, and what's most well, impressive to me about Sean Stockton is that I believe he has thirty five three point shooting, but has not unticked like the ability to shoot three pointers in the SBO. So when I saw the play-by-play -play part where it was Sean Stockton shoots a three-pointer from the top of the key. It's good. I was like, Stockton shooting threes? 29% on the year? <laughs> it's not a good game plan, but it worked out either way. Um, uh, either way, I think Maryland's got, Maryland has got some, uh, some, some big things coming up, you know. I'm uncapping this year, obviously, this upcoming season. Um, Othello and I know uh, Alonzo and Ben trying to make that leap. So you know, uh, watch out for the Terrapins. Just, just to add there, <laughs> I think Alonzo is gonna have to retire himself. I think he's played all four years of eligibility right now. That's his final mm -hmm. year. Yeah. So yeah. there's gonna be someone. He's also over two hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe, I believe I believe our AD actually spoke about that too. Actually, if I could find yeah. Uh, yeah, Eleven's yeah. at two fifty. Yeah. And yeah. he's on his fourth year, so either way, he'd be out. I mean, you can only get to 250 as a filler if your team makes yeah. the playoff. So there's that. Yeah, so he's probably gonna recruit some additional firepower to the wing, and then if he feels like it is gonna add his new filler to follow in Alonso Brixton's footsteps there. But um, my personal. So, I mean, out there, you know. You just have a wing player coming off the bench. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Alexei yeah, Zukov. Yeah, yeah. He's at 170 no, no, next year. Uh, Alexei's like our uh, point guard, correct? Yeah, yeah he's a point, point guard shooting guard. Point guard shooting guard. Yeah. Oh, is he your guys' starting guard though? Oh yeah, he is. He's the starting point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I didn't even notice that. True. Yeah. Yeah, but the Terrapins either way are well poised to repeat yeah. the March March uh, appearance next season. Uh, my personal 
interest in the Sweet 16 was obviously the Duke Blue Devils going up against the reigning champions Oregon Ducks. Uh, in the end it was a solid victory. I believe it was double digits the margin. So there uh, was there was nothing. Yes. Yeah. So, One short. Nine. Oh. It was nine point. Yeah, I should probably have that open <laughs> if I'm going to be talking about it. But yeah, uh, it was not entirely expected a easy or easier Duke victory, but uh, I'm really glad of the way it was sorted out in the end. Uh, I'm really, uh, I was really, uh, I was really enthusiastic about facing the Terrapins once again uh, as we played yeah, you that, in the finals and then last year and now if we were to face you again in the elite eight it would have been a another great matchup but now i'm robbed of that yeah. so well played to georgetown hoyas tonight uh, this podcast will be released after the results are in so yeah uh, moving on to our second topic we'll make our Finals predictions, national championship game, who's in, who's out, who wins, who loses. Uh, my guesses uh, would have been, uh, my predictions would have been the Terrapins against the Gonzaga Bulldogs. But now that the Terrapins are out, I'm pretty torn between the Longhorns and the Blue Devils. Either because I think the Longhorns, if they can repeat that kind of shooting night they had versus the Gators, they can get past the Orange. Even though I, I should, I could say Orange are the more talented team. But yeah, I still think Gonzaga is going all the way and winning the national championship. What about you guys? So, uh, yeah. Uh, for my winner of the top bracket, I had the Duke Blue Devils. And for the winner of the bottom bracket and the tournament as a whole, I had the Wildcats. Um, with the Longhorns, what I see by them, it's they're also very reliant on uh, them shooting well. And that kind of reminds me of uh, the Notre Dame teams I was on in college, where it was me and Joey who were the one and two options. And if one of us couldn't score in a night, we were losing. And... Uh, if we were hot, then we'd like both score like 30 plus a game, and that would then lead us to some upset victories. But as a whole, relying on your team to shoot well on a lot of three pointers, it's generally not the best way to go. As for me, I I definitely did see Gonzaga as a threat simply because uh, Mr. X is just I don't I didn't know who was going to come out of the top bracket. I I personally was going to say the Terrapins. But you know, uh, that's already out the window. I, I, I personally, I think that maybe you could sign up for uh, the Duke Blue Devils simply because they're more reliable. They have a uh, uh, big that's out here. You know, JJ. He's he's doing his work. He's putting in work. Um, I don't know. I, 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 the Longhorns kind of reminded me of the Terrapins simply because. Um, You'd have nights like, for example, like in this in this in this competition in this first round, from five for fourteen, you know somebody else has to start going ten for twenty, you know just to just to keep up the pace. Uh, defensively, we were better, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. So I I think whoever 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 can make the most defensive plays out of the top bracket will will probably have a better chance of beating Gonzaga than they think. Yeah, and for defensive plays, the safe bet is always with the Duke Blue Devils. Yes, um, so the consensus here is that the Duke Blue Devils might meet the Gonzaga Bulldogs in the national championship game, which is right. always a pleasure to hear as a Duke I Blue Devil. I think Arizona's going all the way. Oh, you still think? I, yeah, I, think the, yeah. I, still think, I still think the Bulldogs might have a better chance uh simply because you know with you when you have a talent like they have at the center position it's gonna be a matchup to see though and so yeah you know. i mean the thing is i in my opinion arizona is one of uh the bulldogs worst matchups i didn't look at uh, how they played during the regular season 
uh, mind me though, but because uh, they are one of the few teams that have a defensive minded center, and him going up to against uh, what Mr. X is yeah. not necessarily a bad, uh, uh, the greatest matchup for Mr. X, but also in a team with that so. Uh, top heavy like the Bulldogs where they really rely heavily on Mr. X if he fouls out or gets into foul trouble early that's it for them like they're gonna lose that game yeah and I guess that's just something we'll have to see and yeah. I mean especially in a game in, in a system where it's one and done as we can see update uh, updates upsets are bound to happen and mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised either way let's put it like that it's basically the Wild West now. Everybody, every uh, every top seed should be on alert after mm. uh, Maryland, uh, the situation like that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting yeah. to see how the rest of the rounds shape up and if we'll actually have some top seeds in the national championship game. But we'll move on to our third topic of the week, which is uh, surprisingly a SBA topic. We actually have two slash three, I mean two and a half, SBA topics this week. Uh, we were supposed to have Beowulf as our resident expert for the Pro Leagues, but we'll make do with what we have. So the first round of the SBA playoffs has been completed and the Oklahoma City Rampage advanced past the Boston Minutemen in a sweep. Then the Miami Vice advanced past the Milwaukee Maulers in another sweep. Then there were the Chicago Nightmare going up against the Arizona Inferno. Very intriguing matchup, touted as one of the best uh, first and bottom seed matchups in recent history, but it was also a sweep in favor of the number one seed Chicago Nightmare. Then there were the series we're going to be focusing on this week. The Brooklyn Bullets advancing over the Houston Ravens. Uh, it was a six game series. Uh, Brooklyn winning two first games at home. The first game actually a 60 point margin, 154 to 94. Uh, Alexander Sobek scoring 37 points off the bench with a plus minus of 51. And then Sifa Dojbe with 19 points and 7 blocks to his name. So a total demolition of the Houston Ravens who had real hopes coming into this offseason. And then the second game was a bit more tightly contested match but still a blowout. 27 points in a, another Brooklyn home victory. Then on the road at Houston, Houston nabbed two wins and made the series back to 2-2, 166 to 171 victory for the Houston Ravens and then 120 to 123 victory for the Houston Ravens. But then uh, coming back home to Brooklyn, Ravens took care of game five and then game six at Houston, finally beating out the Ravens 126 to 118. This series was mostly marked with the game one victory of a 60 point margin. Uh, is this, uh, you're our resident specialist now, Pancake on SBA matters. Is this you something got. you foresaw or see quite often in the SBA? Uh, what precisely? 60 point margins in between uh, playoff I, teams. I really, um, and to be honest, in the SBA Sims, I look for the Thunderbird logo and I just kind of swipe down. But I can't really remember seeing a 60 point margin. But the games in general are always pretty high scoring. Like, it's not unusual to see a game in the 135 to 150 area. Nice. So, therefore, if your team guards up and hits your shots a 60 point margin really isn't out of the question yeah and on that note the game three was 166 to 171 which counts to like 337 points as a whole it's a yeah. real change of pace from the ncaa 
Uh, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts in general of these scoring numbers and margins theory? Oh, I think it's I think it's um, a kind of side effect of the luxury of being able to I guess build extent. Um, when two people can consistently go off, you know, I I go back reference uh, game one of this this playoff series that we're talking about. Uh, fifty, what is it? Oh, this is game two. Excuse me. Uh, fifty. Yikes! One second. <laughs> Fifty-one points that was scored uh, by the shooting guard, I believe, Alexander Sobek. Yeah, thirteen of twenty. Yikes! This this it's 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 definitely an efficient player um yeah, yeah, 37. thank you thank you for correcting me on that but i i think it's it's a luxury that comes when uh a lot of players are very very invested in growth and development um to the point where you know there's what six people on the team who can all pull up you know at any moment in time i i know that uh ken armstrong had a game in game two as well if uh if my eyes do not deceive me ken armstrong was uh in their second game 10 for 17 you know 15 16 you know so he's a maryland product you know i'm, I'm familiar with that of course. you know they build their focus might be more offensive so it might actually benefit the whole team if benefit the whole team if everyone is scoring at 20 points you know what i mean from my perspective, obviously, I'm an outsider from, you know, NCAA trying to, you know, focus on getting drafted. Uh, <laughs> that's what I see when I see a score like 171 to 166 or like a 125 to a 98. Yeah, and this was the most tightly contested series being the only series that did not end in a sweep. And then you still had a 60 point margin in a one game so it's it's really unbelievable like uh, how how far and wide the margins can grow in a single game because everyone gets to almost max out all of their attributes going in uh, when they're on in their prime in the SBA because with the the basics of the sim engine is that for example Yao Ming He's a seven foot four, seven foot five center. He would have quickness in the range of like 16 to 20, 21. And then in the system we have in the SBA, you can have a seven foot four center with a quickness of 99, which is yeah. surpassing the likes of the Aaron Fox, Russell Westbrook, all that kind of stuff. So, and Ken Armstrong, if you remember, obviously you remember, but if the listeners remember, scored 50 points in the national championship game back in season 37. 51. 50, yeah, yeah, 51. And now he's still coming off the bench in a playoff series. Mm. And, well, obviously he scored 35 points in only 29 minutes played, which is huge. But the level of standard in the SBA is extremely high and almost unprecedented yeah. for a NCAA player. Also, he came in on or joined up on a really good team. And that's what I was that's another thing I wanted to add. Like I for remember example, I'm already starting yeah. and I mean, I'm obviously putting up like rookie numbers only, but a person like uh what Max Winchester last year, he also had a few 50-point games in the SBA in his first season. So it really also depends on the kind of surrounding that you get drafted into. Yeah, I was going to say, when I first saw the draft results uh, for Ken and Andrew's draft, I kind of felt bad for Andrew. Uh, uh, simply because, you know, I, I looked at Brooklyn, I believe they had just, I don't know if they had just come off a year where they just won the championship. No, they had a... They, they were in the finals, I believe, and then they had a secondary draft pick in the range of 6 to 10. This this might I, just all be garbage. I need to check this out. I remember, I yeah, I remember they, they had a deep playoff run, and uh, they had a deep playoff run, and I was wondering, oh, man, 
you know, what what crappy team is going to get, you know, can services and become, you know, serviceable, you know, uh, ready to challenge the competition and change the hierarchies. Like, uh, of a parallel, if I can make an NCAA parallel. Um, yeah, like Of kind of recruit the recruitment process. I, I saw Duke as this mega school, you know, they, they went out like the Yankees of NCAA. So it, it, it kind of is, is, is used that kind of played into my part of choosing where I wanted to go. But when it's a draft, you know, you never know what pick is going to turn out a certain way. Yeah. And you, you don't get to choose. Like that's the point of the draft, of course. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, it's kind of a finality. Some people's luck shake out well and some people's don't. Yeah. So, so Brooklyn bullets were the season 36 champions. Uh, they also had additional draft picks from Philadelphia uh, via Toronto Thunderbirds and then the second overall selection via Houston in a draft day, draft day trade. Yeah. And with the sixth overall selection, they selected Ken Armstrong and coming hot of a 51 point scoring performance in a national championship game and still being the sixth overall selection. That just is that's that's pretty wild <laughs> to yep, say that's what, could, you, could you imagine like uh ken armstrong in toronto or philly you know that would have been great for those for those squads so you mm. know. yeah but even better for the brooklyn bullets because they never they if they have a revolving door of like good draft picks and good young talent they never have to go to actual rebuild mode so yeah they, the brooklyn bullets they've had a top five draft pick in every single draft i've been around for yeah and they're always a playoff team. Yeah, it is. So... It is kind of daunting, you know, when when one thinks of that. Mm -hmm. uh, just just thinking about like the future of like uh, future of Alan Richmond, you know, it might it might actually go through Brooklyn. We don't know, but uh, <laughs> you know, that's just wishful thinking. But you know, I, <laughs> you know, it, it it does kind of present a challenge to the other teams. So if the other teams play their cards right, you know, make smart moves going forward, perhaps maybe they can challenge it. I yeah. know they haven't won every single one, so. Yeah, uh, it has to be applauded to work. Uh, the current general manager, Chill Zone, and the general manager before him, uh, the former Duke AD, Shaka, have been, the work they've been doing with uh, surrounding themselves with young talent and acquiring draft picks because uh, now the whole league is probably on high alert with draft uh, with tr doing trades with Brooklyn because they seem to be fleecing pretty much everyone regarding yeah. trades with uh, draft yeah, picks moving they're around. like the Boston Celtics in the NBA where they just no matter what seem to win almost every trade yeah they make the best Celtics use. fan, you know. <laughs> I said I was yeah, from... yeah, that's what you said earlier. Yeah, but they seem to make the best out of each and every single asset they ever rolls through the Brooklyn Bullet system. Um, we'll move on to our fourth topic. This is going to be a short one. Uh, well, I guess a short one because we're in SBA waters right now. The SBA finals predictions, I'm going with a safe prediction that the first seed Chicago Nightmare will be facing the second seed Miami Vice in the SBA finals. And I'm... Yeah, I believe that's the prediction almost everyone has. Yeah. yeah. It seems that way. I, I will say, just to be a little bit contrarian, I'll say... Uh, bullets just, just walk off of the bullets you know <laughs> i don't know i i don't know yeah hey, can can go get your ring uh <laughs> but yeah I, I do see i do see it being nightmare vice in the finals but um personally i think the nightmare might have it that's come out come out okay, I i'm pretty sure i have them too Winning it all. Yeah, the Chicago Nightmare, they're uh, 
in the beginning of the season there were some talks about super teams and who is a super team and who is not a super team but the Chicago Nightmare have several um, SBA forum veterans in their prime seasons uh, Brenstel as Samuel Austin Jr. the shooting guard then Evans the team general manager uh, Giovanni Owen Alan Tatum uh, also abbreviated as GOAT and then the current site owner Mo Holtz as Magnum McCoy playing his fourth or third season I can't remember but yeah and then the Miami Vice they're a in the third season yeah and the Miami Vice they're a ragged group of misfits going into the season uh, they have a they have two or three, three it seems, regressed players. Uh, Jogens, Amer Al-Masri, uh, had a career, uh, has a total points earned of 2,109, but has regressed down to 744. And there's my athletic director and the future Miami Vice general manager, uh, Josh McBuckets, Mr. Splashman, playing his third or fourth year as well. And... Yeah, they're, they did really, really well in the regular season. But as I said, they seem to be a raggedy group of misfits. But yeah, I believe they can give anyone a run for their money, really. I definitely would say if anyone would probably do that, give a run for the money to uh, the Nightmare, maybe their inside presence could be of assistance. You know, I see Jason McDougal. Um, his stats, his rates, his inside, his his jump shot is pretty is pretty sufficient. Obviously, six eight is not a great center, in my opinion. But uh, <laughs> anything is possible with these guys. So, I mean, um, I don't really think that there's. I mean, I'm not the resident SBA guy, so you know, I'm in the NCAA circle. But I do see it off. Uh, perhaps maybe five game for gentlemen's sweep. <laughs> I don't know. I probably keep up more with the NCAA than with the, than with the SBA too. To be completely honest with you. Yeah, well, uh, that's something to change going into the for in, into the future. Uh, as I'm gonna be drafted now, and I'll be keeping a. Well, keeping one eye out on the SBA to begin with. Uh, once, obviously, I develop my skill set and whatever, I can probably get more invested in it. But for now, sure, feels like I'm still going to be favoring <laughs> watching NCAA sims where the margins are not 60 points. Uh, well, <laughs> at least not weekly. Uh, we'll move on to our final topic, which is uh, continuing on this note, the... Draft lottery reactions. The season 39 entry draft lottery was concluded and the Colorado Chiefs got the first and second overall selections. Uh, the first overall selection going with a percentual chance of 2% and the second overall going with a percentual chance of 16.6% I believe or rounded up to 17 and then the third selection will go to the Philadelphia Prowlers. So with the number eight pick, it will be the Toronto Thunderbirds uh, who got robbed. With the seventh pick, it will be the Mercer Island Knights. Who, okay, cool, whatever. With the sixth pick, the Toronto Thunderbirds who once again got robbed. Uh, should I also be saying the percentages? Uh, with the seventh pick, the Knights had a five percent chance. With the sixth pick, the Thunderbirds had an eight percent chance at first. All of this is. Um, then moving on. The to... fifth selection will go to the Los Angeles Rail, who've been uh, pretty lucky in recent history with the SBA draft lottery. They had a percent chance. Yeah, chance. Yeah, yeah. They had a three percent chance of landing the first overall selection so they also jumped up and then the Brooklyn Bullets fell to fourth 
be uh, oh, the draft pick from the Dallas Outlaws uh, from a trade mid season yeah. or two earlier. 30%. Yeah, they had the highest chance of a number one selection with 30% via Dallas finishing dead last in the SBA regular season last season. But uh, as Doc Holliday here said, a huge upset as Brooklyn ends up with the fourth pick despite having the best odds. Uh, yeah, some story it would be after we've done after we've been talking about the Brooklyn Bullets and if they would have ended up with another first overall selection but fourth overall yeah. is not too shabby in this upcoming draft either mm. yeah no this draft is a really deep one for sure so um, therefore they've got that going for them and I honestly I'd rather be picking at like the fourth pick than the second or third pick this year almost because if you're in the two to three range you have to uh, ask yourself the question if you're gonna draft uh, steve-o's player millwall just because you know for a fact he's basically a one-year rental and because yeah, he's well, going to be a gm next year and it would have to be a trade but uh i mean yeah. he's a that great I'll... prospect and so you never know who you'll get in return then. Sorry to, sorry to have talked in between some of you saying, but it just like, kind of reminded me, you just kind of reminded me, uh, Pancake. Team, you know, any team wanted a, a guy from a winning institution that contributes a lot, you can throw them these picks. I mean, obviously, uh, Colorado has one and two. Philly has three. Uh, yep. And so I, I, I would consider if I'm a GM, maybe if I would trade for some more veteran presences. Um, but I'm not too sure about their, 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 I guess, motive if they're in rebuilding mode, et cetera. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, I definitely think that the Millwall thing is a bit of a gamble though, because with Steve O, you know, you'll be getting an active member with a job. And then who knows in next year's draft who goes or when your draft pick or what you trade for and what he turns out to be and if that person then stays active or not. So yeah. right, right. It's, it's a bit of a risk. It's probably more than likely that Steve will fall right down the draft boards after he got uh, unveiled as a, another expansion general manager going into season 40. So I my guess would be that in the 7 to 11 range it would be a gamble to take him as well but from like 10 or 11 onwards it's pretty safe to pick a guy with a high TP overall going in to the, yeah. their rookie season. I don't season. think dropping that far. I really don't. Yeah. Well yeah this, this is all based on the general reactions to the mm. uh, pointing out that what about picking Millwall? He, he'll be gone by the fifth pick. That's my all right. prediction. All right. Yeah, I can see that as well. Uh, I mean, just because he really wants to play for his own team. So therefore, I mean, I don't want to really use the term overpay, but he'd be willing to put together a better package than probably most other teams would be for a first-year center. And for a typical... Uh, haul for a like let's say fourth overall selection you won't get exceptional trade packages mm -hmm. after the first year mm -hmm. or going into the draft either so yeah you might be right there but the and also if someone like brooklyn if the players that they really want are no longer available i could see them like picking him up as a backup uh, center who could help them if they needed a center in because they're like to sort out all the minutes and whatnot and then they love picks so then next year they'd yeah. uh, definitely have some more of those the colorado chief general manager Gu sharp was very vocal about not picking uh, millwall at one or two with his picks uh, mm. obviously we can't yet tell if they're gonna make trades moving either of those picks around i wouldn't bet them uh, i wouldn't bet them moving the first overall selection i think it's pretty dead set that they might just select the best player available on tp terms mr x 
and uh, then oh, the chime in. Yeah. No, I was gonna I was gonna chime in with uh, the idea of who who would actually get picked with these picks. Say nothing happens, no one moves the picks. Um, I would say, yeah, Mr. X goes to Colorado uh, with the first pick. The second, I'm not sure. From two on down, personally, I'm not sure. Personally, I'd like to go, you know, number two. But you know, uh, I do, I do see, I do see. Uh, where is it? Where is it? The mock. That's what it is. Uh, it's it's very interesting to see who would go after Mr. X in the air at the moment. What do you guys think? Well, me, myself, JJ Harkwood, and Orlando Villoria the third are both really highly rated prospects in terms of activity and uh, contributing to the league. Uh, but the point guard Dimitrius Marquis Xavier uh, with the third highest TP total going into the draft is hold some carryover i believe uh, i can't remember the exact number of carryover tp tj6 i believe yeah, he's gonna <coughs> he's gonna yeah. get uh get a the, he's gonna build a gap to the first gen guys me and kermskis and then midnight and all those guys then there are also the former miami gm G, J Liso, who is a defensive freak center but will also earn a bunch of carryover so guys are bound to move around a bit andrew warren 13 primo zajek from ucla bruins he's gonna be a he's a general manager player so he'll most likely be picked to the uh, Maulers. milwaukee maulers uh, i think it's mandatory even for him to pick yeah. himself so it's pretty much if you want one a freak tall point guard dmx with some carryover or then if you'd prefer a big man first gen or a real hot shooter from arizona orlando villore the third uh, my first guesses are that the colorado chiefs are gonna beef up their starting rebuild with selecting mr x and jj harklewood then at third, the Philadelphia Prowlers won't be requiring the services of DMX as they, their GM just was drafted last season as a defensive point guard, Marcel Faber. So I would assume with the loss of Kane Fox, they're going to be looking at either a star big man to score or then just taking the basically best player available after. So so, so I would say, so ironically, I would say perhaps DMX falls to four then. I, I don't really see him falling that deep. I think I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the Chiefs pick him up with the one or two pick. Mm -hmm. Just because his build, it's supposed to be a triple-double build. And he's too low of a TPE overall right now to uh, kind of fulfill that goal. But then, once he gets to the higher totals, I believe that he will have a good chance of making them. And just the fact that he's an established member in this league who uh, gets his points and has been active for a long time, that's really a very valuable thing, just because you know you'll actually get a good return long-term off of your draft pick. Well, but, yeah. We, of course, can't tell what the uh, draft date trades will be like or the uh, off-season re-signing period will be like. But uh, my first instinct is still Mr. X and JJ Harker would going to yeah, I, I Colorado wouldn't be surprised Chiefs. Either. Yeah, then Orlando yeah, Villoria. Mr. X number one, yeah. Yeah, so DMX is probably going to go to the Brooklyn Bullets. Uh, well, yeah, probably going to go. That's pretty bad wording. Uh, my assumption is, my thoughts, my first first thoughts are that he's going to be going to the Brooklyn Bullets and afterwards it's a solid assortment of players uh, between the 350 and 390 TP range. 
Adams, yeah. of course, going to the Clippers as well as he's a GM player. But then they're singing high Of course, there is not the Clippers. Huh? Yeah, of course. Of course there is. Yeah. They look like the Clippers, though. Or actually, kind of less they, now, I guess. Yeah, they were the Clippers, yeah. But a very. I'm sorry, would you guys say the draft is more top heavy or would you say there's some hidden gems in there? Just speaking for guys like, you know, Toronto. Uh, no, I, Toronto at the six to eight pick, there's still a, a lot of good players that are coming in. Um, I've seen like a peak of our draft board. I'm not going to mention anything, but there's a lot of good players still available. I mean, uh, this is really, I. If you have a pick one to ten, you'll be getting a good player, and probably even after that. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think of people like uh, I don't know, like I don't know, Austin Roenick. Yeah, mm. yeah. He's yeah, yeah. a player who's most likely going to be picked around ten, but he's still going to be a really good player. It's a quality. And I'm yeah, pretty sure he even gets like carry over this season, but I'm not sure. I think he gets like 30 points but, uh, um, he gets minimal i think i think his earlier character was retired early as an inactive uh, maybe i'm confusing uh, leifer with someone but, else but that's what I I know, i'm not sure but anyway like he's a decent player to have especially he seems like an active person on discord so i don't know yeah, there's actually, uh, I think someone kept count, there's actually 24 or 25 active users going into this draft, so that's one and that's a half really rounds. Uh, typically, yeah. we don't even uh, display the selections for the later rounds, or then they just get passed on. The They get passed the selections of the late second round, but I guess we're going to have three rounds this year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's uh, some of the hidden gems you were asking for the. I mean, Kansas... Jake Curry Kirby is also a bit of a hidden gem, I think. Yeah. I mean, he had a decent play. I remember for freshman of the year, it was between me and him, so that's why I know who he is. But yeah, uh, he seems like a good player. He's been in college now for three years, and the Orange are playing really well this season, and he's the main leader on that team, so. I think he's a good player to pick up 15 or after. So all in all, a pretty, pretty deep draft. The, it's, it could be described as top heavy with the most impressive names, but it's full of good selections all around. The Kansas Jayhawks guys, Trey Hudson, Braden Wilson and uh, Denver Wolf, they all, I believe they uncapped in season. To make yeah, best use of their time so they're low on the tp total right now but they're still active and contributing users all the yeah. same and what about the notre dame fighting irish next season pancake um so i've got two uh, good looking freshmen that I hope stay active and keep updating their player. And then in two seasons from now, I believe we're going to be a pretty good team because next year, two of our fillers will be getting to 199 and then they're upcapping their year, uncapping the year after. So then if they can somehow align it, then it will be pretty good in season 41. If we have four players over 200, plus whoever comes in then still yeah the ncaa with the new recruits each season is gonna be it looks like it's shaping up to be a really competitive really competitive yeah, real. feeder league to the sba and i'm really enjoying the growth in general but that's i guess that's all for this week from five of the week uh, episode 13 We've discussed NCAA, NCAA first round and finals predictions, then all the same to the f from the SBA, what happened in the first round and th our finals predictions, and then some reactions to the draft lottery. 
Uh, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you guys. Theory. Um, I think I'll just start off by saying, uh, greeting guard for Maryland. Uh, we're definitely gonna turn it up. You know, we're gonna turn up the heat on the rest of the competition. Um, SBA teams take notice. I'm gonna be on fire. All right. And uh, cryptic pancake. Yep. Now officially. I once again want to reiterate it, the second most frequent guest on this podcast. Yes, uh, tenure, guest. tenure at the Five of the Week University. You learn your PhD soon enough. <laughs> and <laughs> from at Okocha Star, it's, well, at Okocha Star. Thanks for listening, and we'll be sure to catch you once again next week. Bye. You guys.